we're back and you are now in the thick middle of the U.S. Constitution, line by line. Yes. I'm joined by Paul Fabrizio. Hi. Political scientist. I'm a mere historian. Don I'm Don Frazier. Frazier. Yeah, yeah. Mere historian. Mere historian. And by the way, we need to say, we haven't used said this in a while. We're using this book as sort of a guide. A little guide post, yeah. Guide post. There's many other sources too, but we've used this. So if you see me holding it up, it's a detailed analysis of the U.S. Constitution by Edward F. Cook, 7th edition. So we certainly appreciate that. Kind of an that. industry standard in your yes, field. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Very good book. And uh, All so, the historical co- color commentaries, I'm just making up on the fly. All so. <laughs> well, the political stuff, too. So. <laughs> anyway. Don, we're at a special point. We are at a special point in the history of our Constitution and the history of our nation. And this is actually smack dab in the middle of my research interest, so I may wax a little more poetic at this point. But we're now looking at the Civil War amendments or the Reconstruction amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th. Today... This episode is going to be about the 13th Amendment. Okay. And how many parts of this? Are we just doing it all in one? There is uh, one, two parts, uh, but we're going to do it all in one. Okay. Okay. So there's, so there's section one and section two, but we're just going to lump them together. Okay. Are we ready? Let's have it. Okay. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. And then section two, Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Okay. So what we've done now is we've taken away the the state prerogative on slavery specifically on slavery yeah. and involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime. So let's talk a little bit about why slavery. And it should be obvious, but if you're going to take away a state's prerogative, then you have to amend the Constitution, theoretically. Theoretically. And so what happens during the course of the American Civil War is the Lincoln administration Uh, actually drives part of its military strategy. Uh, What Part of what's driving it is the idea of reasserting Union control in the Confederate states, in the seceded states. Mm -hmm. Lincoln held that secession never occurred, that this was actually kind of a military coup Mm -hmm. d'etat, which established a military dictatorship along the Davis and Lee axis. Mm -hmm. And... um, that the only way to break it would be to readmit various states into the Union and then use them to ratify a 13th Amendment, which would kill slavery once and for all. That meant every state mattered. Mm -hmm. Not just Virginia, not just Tennessee, but every state. So I'm a historian of the Trans-Mississippi, And a lot of people say, well, who cares about what happened west of the Mississippi River? (laughs) I said, well, if you can um, reorganize and readmit these western states, then they can help you ratify the 13th Amendment. Exactly. Because you're going to have states that are going to not want to ratify the 13th Amendment, places like Kentucky and Delaware, Mm -hmm. because they didn't go into this war thinking that this war was about depriving people of property. And these okay. people had slave property right. in Kentucky and Delaware. And they're Union states. Right. And they're going, wait a second, it's not what we signed on for. So they were kicking the gate. Meanwhile, Union war strategy allowed the federal army to essentially kick over the state governments in places like Tennessee and Louisiana and Arkansas, various and sundry other places, and claim a newly reconstituted pro-union government that could then ratify this amendment, making the abolition of slavery the law of the land. The one thing that people fail to realize about the American Civil War is that there was a fear 
that the Confederacy might collapse too quickly. Okay, this is a different spin on the Civil War. Well, what would have happened had, had the Confederacy, you know, essentially collapsed in the summer of 1862, which it looked like it might? I don't know. Guess what? Slavery's still around. Okay. Slavery is not abolished. So it wouldn't have accomplished what Lincoln wanted to accomplish. It certainly would not have accomplished what the abolitionists in that segment of the northern population wanted to accomplish. There's a big segment of the of the northern population that doesn't care if slaves are freed or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some people that have serious constitutional doubts over whether or not this is even legal. Which legal? The, with the war? No. The, well, the war, certainly, but also uh, abolishing slavery. Okay. The way that they were talking about doing it. Mm-hmm. So not everybody's on board this freedom train. Okay. And so um, 13th Amendment was a real dicey prospect. And essentially it gets maneuvered by saying, well, we need to reassert control over this area so we can get their vote to mm-hmm. ratify this amendment. And um, if the if the Confederacy collapses too soon, slavery's not dead. So I would argue that the Civil War may have been artificially prolonged to make sure to get the legal scaffolding in place so that you could get a Thirteenth Amendment, which would have made one of the precipitating events of the war go away. Now, what about the Emancipation Proclamation? Didn't that handle the same thing the 13th Amendment did? It did not, because it only freed slaves in states that were already in rebellion. So, for instance, if you read the Emancipation Proclamation, Kentucky is exempted, Delaware is exempted, Maryland's exempted, places like that are exempted. There's parishes in Louisiana that are exempted. Really? Yeah, because they're held by the federal forces. And so the Emancipation Proclamation does a lot less than people think. What it actually does is it allows for slaves to go from being property to people. The federal legal scaffolding up to that point still depended on slaves being property. And as property, they could be seized as contraband of war. Same as horses, same Mm -hmm. as cattle. Okay? If you then change them to people status and say that they're automatically free, free, they can't be seized. All they have to do is make it to the nearest federal outpost. Mm-hmm. And what they're doing is self emancipating. Mm-hmm. So it should have been the self emancipation proclamation. Mm-hmm. What it also does that people don't realize is by turning them into people, it makes them subject to conscription. And so the federal government conscripts a lot of military-aged male, newly emancipated slaves and puts them into the United States Colored Troops and puts them on labor projects, etc. So it's a lot more complicated than people realize. But the Civil War would have been about nothing if it hadn't been for the 13th Amendment. 13th it Amendment. It had to be the conclusion of the Civil War. It had to be the conclusion of the Civil War. Slavery needed to be outlawed forever, or we've just had a whole lot of needless violence was the right. the position at the point at right. that particular point. So the war began because of slavery. It also began because of civil uh, of states' rights. Yes. But it ended it had to end to end civil uh, to end slavery. Well, I mean, ultimately, slavery needed to be ended by this war okay. instead of the other way around. So that's why the 13th Amendment is so critical. And if you take a look at the last two years of war, there's a lot of strategic initiatives taking place that are really built around this idea of we need to secure this state so we can get their ratification vote. So the, and the Electoral College vote, as it turns out, in the election of uh, 1864. 1864. Yeah. Um, so the amendment was proposed in 1865. It was ratified in December of 65. Um, but the idea for it existed well before. Oh, well before. Well before. So it's actually ratified after the end of the war. But everybody needed to understand that this was coming. 
a, a mm -hmm. constitutional amendment was coming. And then all of a sudden that sucks all the air out of southern slaveholders' positions. Okay. And also slave owners in Kentucky. Okay. And now, Delaware and Maryland, places like that. Now, there was a movie about this called Lincoln. Correct. Um, Steven Spielberg. Yeah. Daniel, Daniel Day-Lewis. Day -Lewis, yeah. yeah. Great and that was about the proposal stage of the amendment, Correct. not the ratification. Correct. But in that, Abraham Lincoln had to do what he could to get the amendment through Congress. And there and, was a lot of resistance. Yeah, and there was a lot of resistance. Because people idea. were saying, wait, this is a fundamental shift in the relationship of the federal government to the states. I mean, everybody could agree that slavery was icky, mm -hmm. but it represented a constitutional question which needed to be answered, yeah. and needed to be addressed head on. So slavery, in in many ways, became kind of a camouflage. They covered up some of the more important constitutional issues by wrapping it up in a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. So now, the verbiage that is used in the amendment doesn't refer to any specific group. Correct. It just says neither slavery, slavery nor involuntary servitude. Correct. So it applies today when we hear oh, about when we hear about uh, sex slavery. Oh, human trafficking human is covered trafficking. by this. This is what we're talking about. Well, in and these days. what do you do with something like conscription? What do you do with the draft? Because that pretty much looks like involuntary servitude to me. And I think a young man of you know nineteen <laughs> years that ends up being sent to Vietnam might have agreed. Did anybody ever challenge? They did. Okay. They challenged it and... Then lost. And lost. So essentially, the draft is not involuntary servitude. I guess you get to serve. <laughs> You're being provided by Uncle Sugar the opportunity to <laughs> serve. Now, what's remarkable about that is that only applies to men. Right. Not women. They don't have to but, register for the draft. Right. Women don't have to register for the draft. So therefore, the rulings that allowed men to be drafted at some point they would have to extend to women oh absolutely if we're going to have women who are registering for the draft and if we we're going to have and if we're going to have true equality yeah okay Very so good. this is a com a lot more complicated amendment than people know <laughs> yeah and, i mean i would guess a lot of people had the attitude like i did for a long time which is like oh you can't have slaves that that ends the conversation yeah that ends the conversation yeah but getting there was what that whole war thing was about. Yeah, and it still holds true today. And, and it still is useful today. It's still very useful today. Yeah. So this isn't about just cotton fields and sugar cane. This also has to do with smuggling human beings. Does it have to do with interns? Hmm, you, good you, question. You think about, you know... But isn't that frequently... voluntary servitude? <laughs> well, is it? You think about college students and, you know, they have an opportunity to go be an intern for somebody. Yeah. Um, for example, Congress is notorious for having interns that don't get paid. Sure, but they're not chained to the wall at night. No. So, therefore, it's okay then? Is that it's your voluntary argument? Voluntary servitude. We're okay. all, we are all participating in a certain degree of voluntary okay. servitude. My presence on this campus is it's voluntary, voluntary servitude. servitude. Okay. So I would... I'd you say would that, argue it's not an issue. Yeah, I'd say interns, you know, know okay. what they're getting into. Okay. But 19-year-old sent to Da Nang they probably didn't. did not. They did not. Okay. So there was actually a case in World War One. That's where conscription first came up. And okay. the guy was passing out brochures saying that... It absolutely. <laughs> yeah, this is essentially slavery. And 13th Amendment makes conscription illegal. And the Woodrow Wilson administration threw him in jail. Locked him up as being a subversive. Yeah, well, and it was did that to a lot of people. Yeah, and it ended up being a First Amendment question. Right. Freedom of speech, and don't I have the ability to pass out these brochures? And they said, no, that's that's not good. So okay. there you have it, 13th Amendment. So there you go. So that's our first of the Civil War Amendments. The next one's a little meatier. The 14th. All right, we'll see you next time.